Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shorangi. I teach English at Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, Prince Anwarshar Road, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Today in module 33, we are going to learn introduction to Bain Johnson with reference to his poetry. This module is prepared by Professor Bisheshwa Chakraborty, who teaches English at Jharam Raj Government College. Friends, Ben Johnson is known for you maybe as a dramatist, but today we will learn him or learn about him as a poet. He was one of the fabulous dramatists before the advent of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare also took part in his dramatic performances in his early part of his career. But Ben Johnson is also known as a poet, a representative poet of the early Elizabethan period. Johnson's poetry is like his drama, is formed by the classical learning. Ben Johnson is noted for all of us as a classicist. He used to follow and adhere rules and strictures perfectly in a classical method and mood. Some of his better known poems are close translations of Greek and Roman models. All display the careful attention to form and style that come naturally to a poet and trained in classicism. He is also humanist, humanist in the order of ancient Greece and Rome. Therefore, some of his poems deal with the humanistic mission. Accepting both rhymes and stress, Johnson used to mimic the classical antiquities of simplicity, restraint and precision. So, Johnson's poems are marked by these rare gems. Friends, let us introduce to the Johnson's genius as a poet. His world of poetry is marked by the publication of Underwood, which was published in the year 1640. It was published in an extended volume as a form of folio. It is a larger and more heterogeneous group of poems compiled and written by Ben Johnson. It contains a celebration of chairs, Mary Orth, execration against Vulcan and some other poems. A celebration of chairs is an extended effort of love poetry. It is an immaculate effort from the part of Ben Johnson to portray various religious pieces or the poems dealing with some rare religious aspects of man. Mary Oath and other poems in the volume coming up in 1640 contains three elegies which have often been ascribed to John Donne as you all are familiar with the metaphysical poet John Donne. One of them appeared in Donne's posthumous collected poems. So, you can easily understand how Ben Johnson is related to his own areas of poetry during his contemporary time. Now, a few words about Johnson's poetry. Epigrams published in the year 1616 folio is an entry in a gem that was popular among late Elizabethan and Jacobian audience and readers. Although Johnson was perhaps the only poet of his time to work in its full classical range, the epigrams explore various attitudes, most from satiric stock of the day, complaints against women, courtiers, spies around 
all come as a matter in his poetry. The, con the condemnatory poems are short and anonymous. Johnson's epigrams of praise include a famous poem to Comden and lines to Lucy Harrington are longer are most addressed to specific individuals. Ben Johnson's poetry is almost famous like the plays we read. The best of Johnson's lyrics have remained current since his time. Periodically, they experience a brief voyage as after the publication of Peter Wallace's edition in 1757. Johnson's poetry continues to interest scholars for the light which it sheds on English literary history and corpus, such as politics, systems of patronage and intellectual attitudes. For the general reader, Johnson's reputation rests on a few lyrics that are on my first son to Celia, to Pensert, Epitaph on Boy Player, Solomon Pevy. Now friends, let us discuss on features of his poetry because the features of his poetry will place him in the context of contemporary during his time, the writers or poets during his time. The reader of epigram, forest and underwood may be at first be repelled by the products of his sweating. Titan, who hammered his verses into their defined, definite and glowing fe felicity. But let him try the quality of the metal and workmanship and most other men's poetry is like to appear trivial. Am uh, uh, among his important critics, some of them have rated Ben Johnson as one of the best of his kind during his time. According to them, Ben Johnson's writing is noted for fashionable things of the court, the classical learning and the vastness of opinion and insight. Let us read a few lines written by Ben Johnson in, uh, in favor of Countess of Rutland. Beauty I know is good and blood is more. Riches thought most, but madam think that store. The world hath seen which all these had in trust and now lie lost in their forgotten dust. Now friends, what is the credit that we can associate with Ben Johnson as a poet? Out of the materials no less varied than his learning, he fabricated songs which are as purely Elizabethan as they can be. That means, Ben Johnson was the product of his time. All his poems are the markers of his classical learning. One of the earliest of his stately hymen to Queen Elizabeth in Cynthia's Revels, written in 1600, perhaps is an important and authentic record of classical lyricism. He writes, Queen and Huntress, chest and fair. Into the climactic scene on Volpone, Volpone, I think many of you understand, one of the premier works in dramatic works by Ben Johnson, he introduced one of the fabulous edition of Catullus. Come, my Celia, let us prove, while we can make sports of love, time will not be ours forever. And we have had enough discussions on Ben Johnson as a writer or as a lyricist under Carpe Diem motif. Now, the achievement made by Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson can be called as the first poet uh, laureate. If Johnson's reputation as a playwright has traditionally been linked to Shakespeare, his reputation as a poet has since the early 20th century. That means, his reputation was not been as a poet was not been 
uh, discovered before the uh, 20th century. So, it is the most recent growth to develop him or to recast light on the works of Ben Johnson as a poet. He can be ranked with John Donne. Johnson represents the cavalier strain of poetry, emphasizing grace and clarity of expression. John Donne, by contrast, epistomized the metaphysical school of poetry. So, if we compare Ben Johnson with John Donne, we can understand there are parallel lines, they work parallelly, they never met each other. That means, Ben Johnson is classicist, whereas John Donne is metaphysical, both approach, sentiment and in aptitude. With the reliance of strained burlesque, metaphors and vague phrasing, both of them worked past each other. Since the critics who made its comparison with Herbert Grierson, for example, were no varying extents rediscovering done, this comparison often worked to the detriment of Johnson's reputation. Now, friends, Ben Johnson as a poet, in this time, we must discuss that Ben Johnson during his lifetime was at least was influenced by John Donne. In 1623, historian Edmund Bottom named him the best and the most polished English poet. That this judgment was widely shared is indicated by the admitted influence he had on younger poets. On the grounds of this, Johnson is rated a high of high esteem because of his scholarship and his influence on immediate poets. For some of his tribe, the connection was much of social as a poet. Herrick described meetings at the sun, the dog, the triple ton, all of them including those like Herrick's, whose accomplishments, accomplishments in verse are generally regarded as superior to Johnson. Took inspiration from Johnson, revival of classical forms of themes, there are many writers who followed the line of Bain Johnson. And another thing we must not forget, his premier contribution to neoclassical literature. So, ben, if we evaluate Bain Johnson as a poet, of course, he has gift and at the same time without some curses as a poet. He was without certain gifts, naturalness and fancy. He was never been considered as a poet with natural gift and fanciful dreams. His style slants towards the intangible and it lacks imagery. His meters are diverse, but his rhythm is not elastic. There are many rigid structures in his verses and Dryden described his translations jaw breaking and you can understand what does jaw breaking mean. But asserts Liguis, an important critic of the age, he contributed to poetry of his country some qualities in which it was then defective. He aimed at putting much meaning into the material line. His compositions tended to be consecutive and regular. He subordinated fire and dash to logic. He taught soundness, reflection, self control. Unquote. I think these are premier issues of Ben Johnson's poetry and these become very prominent during the literature of 18th century. So, Ben Johnson will be uh, remembered for his soundness, reflection and self con control leading to discipline in poetry. So, friend in this particular module, we try to estimate Ben Johnson as a premier poet. We learned Ben Johnson as a dramatist and we are aware of his contribution in pre Shakespearean drama. But here we have learned about Ben Johnson's characteristics of Ben Johnson's poetry and we have studied and examined some of his poems through close angles and evaluated him and rated him as a poet who made contribution and earnest contribution to the growth and development 
of poetry in the hands of the early Elizabethan poets. We have also tried to estimate Bain Johnson in, in parallel contrastive lines with John Donne, a, another important poet of his age. As a whole, Bain Johnson contributed to the classical literature in particular and he, he actually announced the arrival of neoclassicists in the 18th century uh, England. Before we go home, let us take down the hyperlinks shown on the screen. To Celia, drink to me only with thine eyes. By Ben Johnson. Drink to me only with thine eyes. And I will pledge with mine. Or leave a kiss but in the cup. And I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise. Doth ask a drink divine. But might I have Jove's nectar sup. I would not change for thine. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, not so much honouring thee as giving it a hope, that there it could not withered be. But thou Therion didst only breathe, and send still back to me, since when it grows, and smells, I swear, not of itself, but thee. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine, or leave a kiss but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The speaker addressing a woman named Celia. He tells her to drink to him only with her eyes. In other words, he's telling her that she doesn't have to hold up a beer and say cheers, but only has to use her eyes. That he will pledge or drink or say cheers or something to that effect with his eyes. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine. But might I have Joth's neck to sup, I would not change for thine. His desire for a drink that is not a drink, he's asking for a cup with a kiss in it instead of wine. His thirst isn't a bodily thirst, but rather a more spiritual one, it is a thirst, from the soul. Because his, thirst, is from the, soul, it requires something more, divine, than, wine, to satisfy it. So even if he could drink nectar from Jov's cup, might have Jov's nectar sup, he wouldn't, he would rather have Celia's cup, thine. Jov is another name for the Greek god Zeus, or Jupiter to the Romans, the king of gods. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, not so much honouring thee as giving it a hope, that there it could not with it be. Now he moves on to tell a little story about his relationship with the girl. He sent her a rosy wreath. Why? He wanted to give it, the wreath, the hope of everlasting life, it could not wither be, dot in other words. He views Celia as some sort of divine or enchanted figure that can keep things alive that will normally wither and die, like a wreath of flowers. But thou Tharion didst only breathe, and sensed it back to me. He says, rather than keep the wreath to see if it wouldn't die, she sent it back to me. Since when it grows, and smells, I swear, not of itself, but thee. The speaker knows that the woman must have breathed on the wreath, since, when it grows it smells, not like a wreath of flowers, but like Celia. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine, or leave a kiss but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise, doth ask a drink divine, but might I have Jove's nectar sup, I would not change for thine. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, not so much honouring thee as giving it a hope, that there it could not withered be. But thou Therion didst only breathe and send still back to me, since when it grows, and smells, I swear, not of itself, but thee. Thank you for listening.